Greetings, my friends. How are we doing today? The following is a compilation video of three individuals that I think need a little more attention within our online esoteric or left empath or a satanic world, if you will. Three outstanding thinkers who just don't get enough credit. Now, the first one is a little more, let's say, a bit more well-known than the other two. But still, I think it would be wise for anyone who follows this path, I think it would be wise to get to know who they are. Now, this being a compilation video, the, the volume may vary. And also, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe to this channel. It would uh, really help me out. Thank you. He had dreams of sending rockets to the moon, manifesting a moon child, and has a crater named after him on the moon's dark side. He was a sci-fi junkie, a poet, rocket scientist, a practitioner of the dark arts, and the organizer of elaborate orgies. He was one of the founders of JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who also performed rituals based on Enochian magic in which he masturbated upon magical tablets to empower them. He was the link between such notables as Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard, and his mysterious death from an explosion in 1952 has left many wondering if it were an accident or murder. He is Jack Parsons. He was born Marvel Whiteside Parsons in Los Angeles on October 2nd, 1914 to a well-to-do family who came to the West Coast from New England just a year before. After his parents split up, his maternal grandparents moved to California to be with their daughter and grandchild using their wealth to buy a fancy home in Pasadena on what is known as Millionaire's Mile. Renamed John by his mother and called Jack by his friends, Parsons was not like most other children of his day, spending long hours reading poetry and science fiction, which, one would guess, resulted in him getting endlessly bullied by other kids. Being a geek and an outsider, he did find a friend, though, in Edward Foreman, a mechanically gifted kid from a working-class family. And it was with Foreman in 1928 that he began to tinker with black powder rockets. It was also around this time that he began to tinker with the occult when he attempted to invoke the devil in his bedroom. Now, at this point, some of you might be asking, how can one of the pioneers of rocket science also believe, believe in the occult? Truth is, that's not as strange as you might think, mixing science and the occult, because for many centuries the two were not mutually exclusive. For example, some say that if John Dee, the Elizabethan astrologer, alchemist, and all-around occultist were alive today, he'd probably be a scientist of some sort. And there's Sir Isaac Newton, the man behind Newtonian physics and gravitational theory who moonlighted as an alchemist searching for the Philosopher's Stone. Anyway, after getting poor grades in high school, Parsons' mother sent him off to Brown Military Academy, a private boarding school, but he was expelled after blowing up a toilet. While a student at USC, Parsons got word of a guy named Frank Molina in his project on rocket propulsion. 
He and Foreman offered to help even though neither of them had degrees. They were hired anyway, Parsons being the chemist, Foreman the designer, and Molina the technician. And when the trio applied for funding for their projects, they wouldn't bother to mention that their goal was to send men to space, realizing that in the 1930s, most of the scientific establishment considered the notion science fiction. In 1934, Parsons met Helen Northrup and married her a year later. But to Helen's dismay, most of their family funds went to rocket research. Parsons even had to pawn her engagement ring to make ends meet. The young rocketeer's first liquid-fueled motor test took place near the Devil's Gate Dam on Halloween 1936. Three attempts to fire the rocket failed. On the fourth, though, the oxygen line accidentally ignited, billowing fire out at the group. It wasn't long after that that they became known as the Suicide Squad. In 1939, a couple of friends took Jack to the Church of Thelema in Hollywood, where he witnessed the Gnostic Mass for the first time. Already a fan of Aleister Crowley, the founder of Thelema, Parsons began to attend church services on a somewhat regular basis. He grew to believe in the legitimacy of Thelemic magic, accepting its feasibility by way of quantum mechanics. In August 1940, Parsons made it on the cover of the magazine Popular Mechanics. In the article, he discussed the possibility of rockets leaving the Earth's atmosphere, even maybe even reaching the moon. In 1941, continuing with their occultic studies, Jack and Helen were initiated into the OTO's Agape Lodge. In 1942, after getting a few bucks from the sale of jet engines, Parsons acquired a mansion in Pasadena he christened the Parsonage, which filled up with a weird brew of bohemians, writers, artists, scientists, occultists, who all pitched in to pay the $100 a month rent. Living communally, the Parsonage became the new base of operations for the Agape Lodge, where they converted the garage and laundry room into a chemistry lab, held sci-fi readings in the kitchen, slaughtered their own livestock for meat and blood rituals, and performed wild orgies. Encouraged by the OTO's polyamorous sexual ethics, Parsons began to seduce his wife's 16-year-old sister, Sarah Northrup, described as feisty and untamed, proud and self-willed while Helen had an affair with the head of the OTO's lodge, Wilford Smith. Being an enthusiastic practitioner of Philema, Parsons willingly sent a portion of his salary to England to help support the aging Crowley. But, as one would guess, his extracurricular activities began to have an impact on his professional life often showing up at work hungover and sleep-deprived. Rumors of a black magic cult began to permeate the community, so the parsonage came under the scrutiny of both the Pasadena Police Department and the FBI. Wild tales of sex parties, child rape, naked pregnant women jumping through fires, and people attempting to evoke the Antichrist were downplayed by Parsons, who explained to the authorities that the Lodge was simply an organization dedicated to religious and philosophical speculation. Finding no evidence of these seemingly outrageous accusations, law enforcement backed down. By 1943, the U.S. was heavily engaged in World War II. 
and the government saw the benefit of rocketry in the war cause. It was around this time that the Suicide Squad renamed their project the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and in 1944, JPL came under the purview of the U.S. government. It wasn't long after that that Parsons was expelled from JPL because of his unorthodox and unsafe working methods. This was most likely due to him being an abuser of alcohol, cocaine, amphetamines, peyote, mescaline, and opiates. Remember kids, drugs and explosives don't mix. It was around this time that his marriage began to unravel, Helen having become pregnant by Smith and Parsons was now in love with Sarah. No longer with JPL, Parsons and Foreman started the Ad Astra Engineering Company. But the FBI grew suspicious of Ad Astra when it was discovered that they got their hands on top secret chemicals, but they were eventually acquitted of any wrongdoing. But the parsonage continued to attract attention in its Pasadena neighborhood with tales of people chanting, wearing animal costumes, togas, weird makeup, and of course, the orgies. And when there was a vacancy at the parsonage, one ex-resident recalled, in the ads placed in the local paper, Jack specified that only bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, or any other exotic types need to apply for rooms. Any mundane soul would be unceremoniously rejected. One such exotic type to be attracted to the parsonage was sci-fi writer L. Ron Hubbard. The future founder of Scientology shared a lot of the same interests with Parsons, they quickly becoming fast friends. After Hubbard moved into the house, Parsons wrote to Crowley stating that even though Hubbard had no formal training in magic, he is the most thalemic person I have ever met and is in complete accord with our own principles. Taken to the free love aspects of his new environment, Hubbard seduced Parsons' young girlfriend, Sarah, who Crowley denounced as a vampire due to her disruptive nature. Even though he tried not to show it, Parsons was highly jealous, which sent him on a path deeper into black magic, which upset some of the other members of the house. They were concerned with the possibility of negative demonic energies being let loose. In 1946, Parsons decided to take on the ritual he called the Babylon Working to fulfill one of Crowley's prophecies. The aim was to incarnate the Thelemic goddess Babylon in human form and Hubbard insisted on acting as scribe to document the ritual which Parsons agreed to. The ritual began on January 4th with incantations and the waving of talismans, eventually evolving into Parsons masturbating over prepared sigils as Hubbard took notes while scanning the astral plane. After 11 days of invoking and banishing rituals with the aid of consecrated daggers and sigils doused with semen and animal blood, they returned home to the parsonage to discover a new tenant had moved in, a beautiful red-haired woman named Marjorie Cameron. Here was Jack's scarlet woman. Parsons wrote to Crowley, I have my elemental. Thus began a passionate sexual and magical relationship. Parsons and Hubbard continued the next phase of the working in February, this time trying to bring about the moon child, a magical entity brought down from the astral plane. When 
Crowley got wind of this, his response was, apparently Parsons or Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts. This was not what Parsons wanted to hear. It wasn't long after that that he sold the parsonage and with $20,000 he invested in a joint business venture with Hubbard who was to buy three yachts in Florida, sail them through the Panama Canal and sell them on the west coast. But this was all a bullshit con job cooked up by Hubbard, he and Sarah taking off with Jack's money and dignity. Disillusion, Parsons resigned from the OTO, deciding to explore the astral plane on his own, and on October 19th, 1946, he married Marjorie Cameron. But things didn't get much better for Jack. His marriage started to have its problems, and the FBI was again investigating him, but this time on suspicion of espionage which resulted in him losing his government security clearance. Broke and desperate for money, Parsons started a pyrotechnic company for the Hollywood film industry. The couple was able to move into a house right next door to the old parsonage and began to throw parties, rituals, and poetry readings again. On June 17th, 1952, while preparing a batch of explosives for a film, Parsons' lab exploded with a blast so large it could be felt a mile away. The explosion broke his bones, tore off his right arm, and laid open his scalp. He was still conscious when he was discovered, but died on the way to the hospital. When learning of her son's death, his mother took her own life by way of overdose. Jack Whiteside Parsons was only 37 years old. Now, there were rumors that the explosion seemed a bit fishy, that it was impossible that someone with his great knowledge of explosives could die making simple pyrotechnics. But nothing in the way of murder has ever been substantiated. Police concluded that his death was probably a drug-induced accident or maybe even suicide. Recently, while doing some research for a video, I came across the French writer, philosopher, Georges Bataille. Now, I was vaguely familiar with him because of one of his books, a twisted tale of eroticism called Story of the Eye. And I had heard about his magazine and secret society he established, but really knew next to nothing about him. Digging deeper, though, sparked my imagination, and the more I discovered, the more intrigued I became until it turned into a minor obsession. Georges Bataille, born in 1897, wrote essays, novels, poetry, and such, expressing a fascination with eroticism, mysticism, and the irrational. He viewed excess as a way of gaining personal independence. You know, the whole road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom thing. In the 1920s, Bataille began hanging out with the French surrealists, and during this period he started editing and formulating several works on sociology, literature, and religion. In 1928, Bataille published his first novel, The Story of the Eye, under a pseudonym, but wasn't revealed that he was the writer of that infamous work until a few years after his death. Bataille worked as a librarian and medieval specialist at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris until 1942, and in 1946 he founded an influential literary review journal which he wrote and edited until his death 
in 1962. Now, this is the general info you're going to get on Bataille when looking him up, but what I find fascinating is that period of his life during the 1930s. For Bataille was, by his own admission, the most godless of modern intellectuals, an anti-theist mystic, and the founder of a sacred cult of sacrificial orgy. Like most intellectuals of the 1930s, Bataille found the tide of fascism sweeping over Europe to be most disturbing. In truth, he recoiled from both fascism and communism because of their commitment to collective structures of nation, state, and authority. As a response, he founded the journal Asafel. Asafel was a public review which published five issues from 1936 until 1939. In this magazine, Bataille and other prominent French intellectuals published essays and reviews, poetry and art that celebrated the primordial individual and the power of instinct. The intent was to create a combative energy against the authoritarian political surge. Asafel, however, was not limited strictly to the realm of print. At the same time he created the journal, Bataille founded a secret society also called Asafel. The symbol of the society, which was also on the cover of the first issue of the review, was drawn by the French artist André Masson. It features a headless man inspired by the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci, and the word Asafel comes from an ancient Greek word meaning headless. Since the society was secret, few facts about his agenda are known. But what we do know is Bataille organized nocturnal torchlit gatherings in the woods near an oak, an oak that had been struck by lightning. There, members of the society were required to partake in rituals, perform acts of sexual transgression, and meditate on the works of Friedrich Nietzsche and the Marquis de Sade. Bataille was also fascinated with that most extreme of rituals, human sacrifice. There was discussion amongst the members of Asafel about performing such an act but it was never actualized, even though some members themselves volunteered to be the sacrificial victim. The reason why this never happened was because none of them was willing to be the executioner. With Asafel, Bataille wanted to start a new religion, or anti-religion, based upon Nietzsche's diagnosis of the post-theological epoch. Basically, the aftermath of the death of God. That's what the headless man represented, the death of God, headless, no God. Now, with the collapse of the Judeo-Christian theological order, Nietzsche believed the foundation of Western civilization would also collapse. Therefore, nihilism would arise. Since the shadow of the dead God may continue to engulf us for thousands of years, the war between Dionysus and the Crucified would commence. Nietzsche believed that the shadow of Yahweh and all its manifestations must still be vanquished so humanity could undergo naturalization. But in the midst of such a crisis, Nietzsche wondered how will we console ourselves and transcend this nihilism? We do it by partaking in Dionysian aspects of existence. It is only through such actions, said Nietzsche, that we will be able to live up to that terrifyingly sublime deed of murdering God. Through Asafel, Bataille was determined to lead us out of the labyrinth of contemporary nihilism and show us the way back into the heart of darkness. He was determined to expose and embrace the horror.
Also, as one who adhered to Nietzschean thought, Bataille hated how the great philosopher's legacy had been warped to the point where even Hitler claimed him as an inspiration. The person responsible for this bastardization of Nietzschean philosophy was Nietzsche's sister, Elizabeth, who rewrote some of his material to make him sound like an anti-Semite and nationalist, which, in truth, he was neither. So, besides establishing a Nietzschean anti-religion, one of the functions of Asafel was to clear Nietzsche's name. But, unfortunately, not much was to become of Asafel and Bataille's greater goals because a little thing called World War II got in the way. With Asafel and his works of eroticism, Georges Bataille has found an audience amongst the avant-garde. Within some circles, his influence has been considerable, almost as significant as his heroes, the Marquis de Sade and Nietzsche. For some, his joyful cynicism in the face of modernity's emptiness and his uncompromising drive to peel back the layers of civilization, exposing its obscene core, is enough to make him great. So, in conclusion, I pose a question. Could Asafel be considered the left-hand path? It has some of the similar or familiar trappings of the left-hand path. What do you think? Leave your comments down below. Maria de Nagloska was a Russian occultist, esoteric high priestess, and proponent of sex magic who established and led a secret society in Paris in the 1930s. Her occultic philosophy centered on the importance of sex for the elevation of humanity, and also on what she referred to as the third term of the Trinity, in which the Holy Spirit from the Christian Trinity is recognized as the Divine Feminine. Now, that's all well and good and to each their own, but why would I, a practitioner of the left-hand path, make a video on this obscure occultist who utilized Christian terminology in her practice? It's because she was willingly referring to herself as a satanic woman. Maria D. Nagloska was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1883. Her father was a provincial governor of Kazan who was poisoned and her mother died when she was 12. Orphaned, her aristocratic aunt took her in and had her educated at the exclusive Simolna Institute. As a young woman, Nagloska's highbrow family basically disowned her for falling in love and marrying a Jewish commoner who she had three children with, her husband eventually abandoning his family in 1910. Cut off from her family's wealth, she began teaching Russian in Geneva, Switzerland and worked as a journalist. And it was in Geneva where she formulated her libertarian ideals. Her views were radical for their time. Thus, she was arrested and kicked out of Switzerland in 1920. Possessing a Polish passport, though, allowed her to settle in Rome at the apartment of a friend. While in Rome, she again worked as a journalist, this time for the newspaper Italia, and met the ultra-traditionalist Roman pagan occultist Julius Evola, becoming close friends and possibly lovers. 
Nagloska, with her independent ways and Evola, a delegate of all things masculine, seemed to be ill-matched. But it was most likely, though, that her aristocratic upbringing and vast intellect won him over. But it wasn't just through Evola that she acquired her vast occultic knowledge. While in Rome, she met other Russian occultists and members of a sex-based religious order, one, it is said, Rasputin had been a member of at one time. But she claimed the major influence on her esoteric development was a heretic Catholic monk that taught her that the Holy Trinity was a triangle, one corner representing Judaism and an age that was dead, the second Christianity and the dying age of the Christ, and the third the Holy Spirit and a new age of sex and the feminine. And it was through the feminine that a dark aspect would be brought in, that which was absent from the other two ages. In this dark force was Satan. After being invited to lecture in Egypt, she moved to Paris. Even though the French authorities would not allow her a work permit, she supported herself by conducting occult seminars on her ideas about satanic sex magic. Present at these sessions were notables such as the American occultic adventurer William Seabrook, the surrealist artist Man Ray and Andre Breton, and erotic author, philosopher, and founder of Asaifel, Georges Bataille. She referred to her lectures as a doctrine of the third term of the Trinity, and her society she called the Brotherhood of the Golden Arrow. Here she put forth her idea of a new age of the mother that would supersede that of the father presented in the Abrahamist faith. To say her events were controversial would be an understatement. Nagloska's new religion would reintroduce the carnal aspects of the divine, and on Halloween 1930, she held her first mass of gold. Removing her golden robe and wearing only a small crown, she laid upon the altar where a male initiate placed a chalice containing wine on her genitals for the mixing of the godly male fluids and the satanic female fluids. Lying there in a trance-like state, she was meant to be a conduit for God to arrive through male sexual arousal. And during the ritual, the male initiates recited this oath. I will strive by all means to illuminate myself with the aid of a woman who knows how to love me with a virgin love. I will research with companions the initiatory erotic act which by transforming heat into light arouses Lucifer from the satanic shades of masculinity. At the end of the service, Nagloska came out of her trance and declared the mother religion of the third term of the Trinity was now constituted and the mass of gold was over. Also, while in Paris, she created a newspaper called The Arrow that not only had articles written by her, but also by other occultists, such as Evola, publishing 20 editions over its three years of existence. In 1931, she translated into French a collection of writings by the African-American occultist Pascal Beverly Randolph on the subject of sexual magic and scrying. 
These publications of Randolph's little-known teachings were the source of his subsequent influence on European magic. About two-thirds of the book are Randolph's writings, while the remaining was Nagloska's, sourced from what she referred to as a necromantic conversation with Randolph. The book explains how sex is the fundamental universal force and the most characteristic evidence for God. The following year, she published The Light of Sex, a mystical guide to sexual ritual that was a must read for those wanting to enter into the Brotherhood of the Golden Arrow. In late 1935, while consulting her scrying mirror, she was traumatized by visions of a catastrophic war to come and of her impending death. So, in early 1936, she met with her disciples and said goodbye, giving away some of her cherished items and moving in with her daughter in Zurich. There, at the age of 52, on April 17, 1936, Maria de Nagloska died. In conclusion, my friends, Maria de Nagloska attempted to return the shadow to the god, reconciling the light and dark forces through male and female sexual union. She also encouraged others to imagine Satan not as a destructive evil spirit, but as a force within humanity, a symbol of man's desire for joy and freedom. For more information on Maria de Nagloska, you can find her works on Amazon and other sources. Also, I recommend the book Sex Magicians by Michael William West, an excellent read. Until next time.